Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and thank you for joining us for one of our talks today. So thrilled today to be talking about the fantastic Apple TV Plus show Acapulco with co-creators and showrunners Eduardo Cisneros and Jason Schumann. And I wanted to start by asking you both about how far out you were mapping this story narratively, because in, in watching all of the episodes in the first season, there's so many details that you're starting to layer and texture throughout that season, but there's also a lot of open-ended details and things Things that you're already teasing for the next season and beyond and so i was interested in in not just kind of when you first started mapping out the first few episodes but how far down the storyline and character arcs was it necessary for you to go in order to tell the story in the way that you wanted because we are jumping between the past and the present i think that it, it always makes us look smarter and makes us look good if we say like we have everything planned out in our heads but uh, I think there is a balance where you don't want to just make it up as you go along because you, you do want to know, at least conceptually, we want to know what the arcs are going to be. And that has not changed, you know, a lot since we since the inception of the show. So we we do have a general idea of what and and a lot of it you already know because you already know where the character ended in the present day. So there is a, a general shape of what's going to happen throughout the years. Uh, and not only in his personal journey, but also his relationships to other characters and so forth. Um, but uh, TV is a living organism in a way. And you, sometimes you think that, let's say, people are going to react to a certain character in a certain way. And then it goes in the other direction. So you realize that you can't commit to, to a specific choice when, you, you know, you all of a sudden say, why make this character the bad guy when now everybody loves that? Like now it's going to be a betrayal of character, uh, things like that. So you, on one hand, you can't just aim, you can't just wander aimlessly, but also you need flexibility to respond to. I think that's a big difference, uh, given that we, we mostly at this, in, in, these days write features and produce movies, uh, but my background is and we both have experiences in tv so the, the big difference i would say is uh tv can be flexible and you have more opportunities to reshape a character to give them a, a different point of view to different give them a turn so it, you know let's take advantage of that and the show really successfully utilizes the tool of voiceover narration, but it's a very tricky device to utilize narratively because it has to always feel like it's enhancing what we're seeing on screen and not being utilized instead of something that we're seeing on screen with the characters. Um, and so what were some of the challenges that came to writing a show that, that relies on a device like voiceover narration so heavily? Well, um, we want to be smart with it because the, the audience is, already very savvy about it they've seen it a million times and now even more so when there's peak tv and there's 500 shows out there and everybody has their own take on it so um we we wanted to own the device and use it not only in a gimmicky fun way but make it an element of the show and uh at, at the end of the day we're, we're in we we kind of phrase it as this is the way Maximo remembers things the way that it happened. Not all of it might be the way it happened, but this is his recollection, and we're we're seeing everything through the lens of that. So you can use that in a fun, creative way, and you can also use it in a more serious way. Uh, so we just own it, and we just own it to. Um, and the other challenge that I think is more recent that maybe in in. Uh, you didn't have as, as, as present was the whole uh, hindsight effect where we are more used now and more aware of how things look through the perspective of time and how certain decisions don't age well. And so I, I think we also wanted to be truthful to what the 80s were and not revise mm -hmm. or, you know, what, what it was. And be, but at the same time, have the benefit of the present day in hindsight say like, well, that was not okay back then. Or that was, in, in, especially from the point of view of this young kid who's like, it, it comes from a different era. He's like, whoa, how, how is it that? So we, we lean into that also. So the audience know that we're not ignorant of that, that we're, that we want to stay truthful to the era, but also, uh, 
be cognizant that we're in living different times. And when it comes to the comedy within the show as well, um, what's really wonderful is that there are moments where we're able to laugh at something that a character does, but we're not necessarily laughing at who a character is. The comedy never punches down at anybody. And even when you take characters like Diane and Chad, who when we first meet them on the surface seem like one thing, you still give them that layered textualization where we understand where certain behaviors come from, even though you're not excusing certain blind spots. Um, and was it, re was it something for both of you in finding the comedic tone of the show that it was really important that it was never punching down no matter who the character is yeah i think there's a testament to to our showrunner chris harris and he, we share this philosophy with him uh and it is great that we never really spell it out but as we were shooting the show some of the actors came in and say oh you know i'm used to playing this thing this trope and i'm so happy that you didn't do it. And to, so to have the actors recognize that, that um, we can say, you know, we, we like that when you read some of the feedback and the reviews, uh, they do pick up on some social commentary. We, they do pick up on some of the punching up that we do. Uh, so it's good to have that and have a little bit of bite and, and some writing the, about the show been mentioned as like subversive which mm -hmm. we find very flattering uh, so we can have a little bit of bite but when it's not a, at the expense of a group of people or, or or actors or any of that yeah was that important to you as well jason from the get-go yeah the, <clears throat> well, some of the first conversations eduardo and i had even when we were creating the show was just this idea of the have and have nots and the fact that maximo is one of the poorest kids in Acapulco working at one of the richest resorts in the world. And the, the, the idea of that, that alone says a lot. So let's focus in on who these people are. And so in creating not only Maximo and the people in the downstairs part of the resort and giving them a real backstory, a real uh, human uh, characterization, it was also creating people like Diane and Chad I mean, I'm very well familiar with the 80s tropes of like the blonde hair, blue eyed guy who's always sort of like Karate Kid and, and, and all those movies where it's that's sort of the villain. So we wanted to play on that. So, you know, Cord looks the part of what we envisioned, but the whole hope was that we could humanize him in a way that was fun for the audience, but also very emotional and interesting for the characters where on first glance, he looks like that stereotypical thing you've seen in 80s movies and TV shows. And then as, as you watch the episodes, the onion peels just a little bit enough to go like, oh, okay, there is a, a warmth to the, to even people like that, even entitled sort of good looking uh, people, of that era had elements to their personality that that you can kind of sympathize with. And so we had, a, we tried to have a lot of fun with that and, and continue to even as we continue telling stories for, for the characters. And the show is so visually vibrant and really leans into the time period of the 80s in the most glorious way. And what's great is it feels like you're never afraid to make the large choices and the big choices in terms of visual aesthetics. And yet it also never feels like it's stepping over into becoming a parody, which is really challenging to do with something like the 80s where you've got such big colors and even just the hair is bigger. Was there a challenge in making sure that it, it never felt that way and it still felt very grounded even when you know, you're know you seeing a staircase in a hotel which doesn't have any railings to it, which is one of my favorite details in the hotel, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there is a, 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 a back and forth. I think we wanted to actually make a distinction between the uh, Las Colinas being a heightened world because that's the way Maximo remembers the, these, this Shangri-La. But also when you go back home, we wanted it to feel real, and especially uh, because you only get so many opportunities to... to portray a Mexican family and a Mexican home in a way that feels warm and a way that feels also authentic and that people watching who are of that culture or of that part of the of, of part of the world to say yes that's what it looks like they did a good job of uh not make it like 
TV pretty, but also not make it depressing. So, uh, but we also had an amazing set designer, Nico Scavini. He's, he's brilliant and a great team. So, um, um, I don't know. What do you think, Jason? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think if you remember a lot of our conversations early on were about how Hollywood typically does portray Mexico. Maybe not resort Mexico, but when you watch not, you know, more dramatic movies or TV shows about Mexico, it always has that very foggy sort of tinted filter that makes things look smoky or almost uh, yellow. And we were very conscious that we wanted to portray a different Mexico that yes, it's in the 80s, but also even if it was present day, we still wanted to convey a Mexico that is more, frankly, it's just more truthful. I, I've been there now dozens of times with Eduardo and it's just so, so much beauty and, and natural beauty and then architectural beauty and costume uh, or, or costume of wardrobe that, that, that uh, especially people in Mexico City wear. And so it's just like, how can we just how do we portray Mexico in a totally different light than has been seen in American production, in the United States productions? Yeah. And what was the moment when you both realized that you wanted to utilize the very specific color palette that's in the show? You know, it's these huge pops of pink, but then also a lot of blues and yellows. And then we've got like the red, which comes across on the uniform and really all these very vibrant colors leading with that pink. Oh man, that was a, a, a collaboration with Richard Shepard, the pilot director. He he sort of pitched us this bold idea of just painting the hotel the color it is. And it was a big sort of leap, but everyone was behind it. And I think when we saw it, it was like, oh man, that was a big swing. But I'm so glad we took that swing because it just it changed everything for us. It, it just, the cast and crew just felt like we were in a different world. And then when you saw it on, uh, in the monitor or, or watching it on television, you're just like, what a great idea. I can't, I wish I would have thought of it, but it was, it was Richard Shepard. And in mentioning Richard, you know, and, and speaking to working with him and the rest of the directors on the show, how did you land upon what you wanted the stylistic language in terms of camera work and the way that you were framing the story? Because we're seeing it, you know, we're seeing the flashback sequences through Maximo, you know, so we're seeing the hotel in the way that he sees it, like you were describing the warmth of his home in the way that he remembers it. And then we have the intimacy of the way that he's talking with his nephew in the present day. So stylistically, it's two different approaches within the show as well. Yeah, we had a, um... Uh, a very specific visual design that the camera work would be one way at the resort and another way when say it was at home with the family, we, we wanted that stark contrast to come across. So we had a lot of discussions and meetings about um, uh, what the style of the show would be, especially if he's at the resort and he's loose and he's walking around, we wanted that sort of loose camera feel. And then when he's at home and it's, it's not like at home is boring or depressing. It's just, it's a different world for him. It's, it's his mom and sister who he loves. It's this family he's trying to protect. So we wanted a more locked off kind of look. I mean, Eduardo, maybe you can add some color, but I, I believe that was our intention. I, I, I feel like it's almost the, the old <laughs> other way around. Because <laughs> it, it, I remember it's, it just blends in so well. And, but it, it, at the moment before we made that, this, you know, the decision collectively, the team, um, it just felt like it could go wrong. But uh, there are also, and in the same way that there are all these questionable portrayals of Mexico. There's also great example by examples by Mexican filmmakers. So we, you know, we we looked at the way that Cuaron, Alfonso Cuaron lo lovingly portrays Mexico and uh, Iñárritu. Uh, so there was a little bit of that and, and Richard Shepard also mentioned some of that, which by the way, um, uh, Vanessa Bauche, who plays among us in Amores Perros, uh, uh, if the uh, 
first Inyarito film. So it was some something that felt real, but without again without feeling like depressing or condescending or something. And La, and the Las Colinas Resort has this uh, grandiose, uh, you know, wide lands, you know, more mise en scène. This this feels more staged because it is a stage in a way. Um, so it was it was a trick com combining those two things. It, again, when you're mixing things that are so different, but it it, it works. <laughs> a lot of these things were swings that we, we in the creative team or production designer to, we were just trying to take this big swings and almost felt like it didn't make sense but we were very lucky we're happy that it seems it seems like it works so uh we're gonna stick with it you know and and like we were saying before we are primarily seeing the story through through maximo's eyes but there there still are moments where we step away from him narratively at the resort and at the hotel you know we see characters without him present without him witnessing something firsthand um was it easy to figure out when you wanted to step away from having him in a scene and having him directly see something that he's narrating in that way hmm Remember, we had discussions about how does Maximo know this? He wasn't there. And so then we have an episode where the kid in present day asks him and he's like, ah, I heard about it later. Just go with it, Hugo. Um, we're aware of, of the fact that you're hearing it from someone's point of view, yet maybe they weren't there for every beat of it. I hope that the audience, is, we hope they're more engaged in just the story than in the nuances of how or what he could have known uh, in hindsight, um, but we're very aware of it. And, and even so to the point where we're trying to find ways to use it for comedy, um, for those who have or haven't seen the show, like that there are ways he, that young Maximo is getting information that we're just trying to have fun with it because it is at the end of the day, older Maximo telling the story. And sometimes he embellishes like in the pilot with, him kissing the girl, it's like, and then the kid stops him and he's like, ah, I know you guys need something exciting to happen every 30 seconds. Um, so we're we're looking for ways of humor, laughter, lighten the, 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 the tone overall, keep it fun. But like Eduardo said, at the same time, understanding that there are themes and there are character arcs here that are, 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 are things that we take seriously and things we're trying to make entertaining while at the same time bring you into a world you might not really know much about. Yeah. And to that point, are the spaces where you want to play around with the idea of how reliable is a narrator? Is that is that primarily usually always stemming from comedy? Because even the moment where we suddenly learn that he's been calling one of the characters by the entirely wrong name the whole season because he misremembered it. And so there's a lot of moments where you really get the opportunity to play around with how reliable is what he's telling us. Well, that, that could be fun. We definitely talk about it and and. Uh... Like I said, we always wanted these to our advantage and to uh, it, it, it's almost a, a flaw that can also help the narration feel more real because that's how we tell stories and uh, and memory is a tricky thing. So uh, and this is in it. So much is happening in the past, but at the same time, it's happening in the present. There's not a passive narration. A lot of it is of, of what older Maxim is doing is like a mea culpa and. A lot of it is trying to come, you know, tie some loose ends in, in his own head about things that happened. So we, we will see present day Maximo having his own arc. And hopefully that also lead to changes in his narration, his approach. And yeah, there's so much to explore. It's a very rich resource. And, and the show is so feel good and positive and optimistic in the in the way that we're watching it and experiencing these characters. And at the same time, it doesn't shy away from creating tension, but the tension works because it comes from a place about human connection. It's incredibly grounded and it's really about very naturalistic tension between characters rather than what would make the more heightened dramatic choice. Was that an easy balance and line for you to find in where you created that dramatic tension or was it a little bit exploratory when you first started working on the scripts and developing these characters that that's eduardo and i's relationship in general <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say. We're, we're such funny optimistic people but uh but then we do have um 
conflict and we do have things that we each are learning from life from each other and so really i mean memo and maximo are both like a little bit of both of us and a lot of their dialogue is literally how we talk to each other as friends but also sort of looking out for one another but also being critical of one another and also um saying stupid things to each other so we try to draw from real life as much as possible because comedy is always in the specifics and the more specific you are the more relatable somehow you are to more people and we're trying to also bring an audience in and let them connect to to everything possible but um yes i mean just to answer your question we're we're trying to keep it light and fun but also uh, understand that life is also dramatic and takes turn takes some shocking turns so we're always trying to keep the story rolling but also keep it grounded i mean wouldn't you say eduardo yeah i mean i was going to say that that's if if i could find some kind of come up thread of of the things that we've written and and, and produced was mostly as writers uh jason and i were very drawn to uh, playing with tone and having seeing how 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 much you can get away with in terms of tonal shifts and how in the spectrum of emotions because that is life you know you do, life is not like 100 percent of comedy all the time or 100 percent drama so uh my you know i i had a working relationship with Eugenio Alves for the longest time where we did just flat out sketch shows and sitcoms but the our joint project that was our crossover uh, movie was instruction not included, which has huge tone shifts too that people seem to respond to. And more recently, uh, Jason and I wrote uh, and produced this movie that we love for focus features called uh, Half Brothers. Um, that you, now it's, it's available on these platforms, and and we love that people say we laughs our butt left our butts off, but also we're so moved by the ending and. And when people send you messages on social media and say, yeah, all this stuff is very funny, but oh my God, I connected with this and I've, I saw myself in this character was moved. So to have both things and to have that range of emotions, is, is, it's something great. So not always, you you know, no, it, not everything is like a home run in, in terms of like landing that balance. But when you do it, it I think it's great. And from the way that a lot of the cast have talked about working on the show, it sounds like there was a real opportunity for them to sit down with the, you know, with you guys and with the creative team and to have conversations and to really get a lot of details off of the page in terms of where's their character art going? What are some of the details that you kind of see for their characters between the lines in the script? And, and what were some of the things that you wanted to make sure that you conveyed to the cast or how much of their journeys and arcs ahead of what they were getting in the initial scripts did, were important for you to be able to share with them that you wanted them to know for their performances? Eduardo, well, you were nodding like you had an answer. <laughs> I always want to look like I know what I'm saying. But <laughs> as you know, it, it is rarely the case. Uh, no, I think that again, because we have an amazing cast and I know probably most people who are talking about the shows would say that, but we we mean it. We we have uh, an amazing cast, and it was such uh, an essential part of getting this first season to the finish line because we we shot during COVID and we shot during in a pre-vaccine world, and we had all these restrictions. So we had to keep everybody in all like more like summer camp. Um, so we and we. Luckily, we had great people and they all had uh, something to say and they connected to the material as opposed to just like, oh, I'm here to do my job. They, everybody embraced their character and they were looking out for their character. So that was a great resource for us that, to see how they felt about their characters and how that could help us in turn uh, find, a, find an, an interesting story for them. 
And and Jason was bringing up kind of the way in which you work together and how that's a real opportunity to learn from one another as well. And so in the time that the two of you have spent within this collaborative relationship with one and each one another, what would you say are the things that you have learned the most from each other? <laughs> I mean, I could talk literally for weeks about, you know, how Eduardo has opened my eyes to the world, honestly. Um, uh, the little bubble that I was living in, whatever that was, uh, and then Eduardo sort of says, there's a whole world out there, has really inspired me to see the um, opportunity and the necessity for more stories, for more points of view. And to be more specific, Eduardo and I are both big theme people. We, we don't even start writing anything until we've decided on a theme. And a lot of those themes are coming from our lives, things that are happening to us or currently happening to the world and things that we want to write about, things we want to talk about. So even in that, um, as we then talk about it and put it into our work, uh, even episode six, if I can just give kudos to Eduardo, we made the whole <clears throat> episode about the theme of going where you're wanted. Uh, Maximo gets rejected and is feeling lost and his best friend tells him, hey, sometimes you got to look to see where you're wanted and go there. And then ironically, that became a big theme in my own life. And I constantly tell him, I'm so glad we wrote that episode because I literally have taken that theme and tried to apply it in, in my own life. And so the literally the work sometimes does uh, trickle down in, into your own life in a big way. Just with whatever Jason said. <laughs> no, I mean, I think, I, I, no, I completely agree because in, in, in many regards, we, uh, we, we are so in line, like on the same page and we, we share a lot of interests and a lot of passions uh, in, in, in our values in terms of our, our, our work, but there are also other aspects of our personality that could not be any more different. And the benefit of that of somebody who is, See, making you see things from other perspective and making you learn things about yourself. So, the are I think a lot of the uh, benefit in professionally speaking from our partnership is that we we have a great way to bring those uh, oppo opposing point of views, but at the same time find very easily a way to to blend them together or find you know the best the synergy of those things. Uh, and also in my in my personal life, because I am my personality is so different than Jason, and and, and many times it, it lack, lacks those skills or those abilities or those uh, that um, that uh, he's always nudging me to to you know step out of my comfort zone and things like that that I wouldn't do wouldn't have done uh, if, you know if if I wasn't hanging out with Jason. So um, I think uh, you know if it if uh, if it didn't broke like. Why well, fix it, right? Yeah, I I love hearing all of that so much, and and I think that what you've both created within this show with the rest of the team is something really really special, and I look forward to hopefully many more seasons of Acapulco. Thank you so much, Jason and Eduardo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us.